I think what is happening is probably the best thing that could ever have happened. Uh, I, I personally believe that the joint challenges of a recession and having to confront the issues of climate change over the next 40 years, coming to an 80% reduction, are exactly what we need in terms of perhaps a bit of wet haddock across the face, waking us up to realise that maybe we need to be doing business in a different way with a wider stakeholder involvement um, which leads to resilient communities and so on. And I think the, the, the world of capital has been fairly immune to seeing a social role in what it does and I think increasingly I'm finding when I'm talking to people who run big companies is that their heart is telling them that they would like to see their companies transform to get more of the added value of the company into a wider constituency than just simply shareholder value. Um, I mean, you could turn it on its head and say that for shareholder value, just translate it into stakeholder value, but the trouble is the word stakeholders become rather cliché laden and it's rather unspecific as to what you mean. New business models are going to require looking at how revenue is generated from creating, if you like, uh, more cooperative type arrangements. Uh, so the profit doesn't become a bad word, it shouldn't, it, it, profit's a good thing, but that it is, it, it is achieved in a slightly different way. To be most specific, if you take an example, say, like energy, you take a, a county like Cornwall, where there are 212,000 households, they spend, let's say for the purpose of the conversation, a thousand pounds each on energy. If you were to do what they do at football grounds and do securitization by selling effectively forward selling bums on seats over 20 years, you would say 20 years of 212,000 times 1,000 is a load of money. And that would give you the capital to create an infrastructure which could be jointly owned by the communities that are going to guarantee to buy whatever it is you produce um, and the organisations and structures uh, put together to deliver it to them. Um, and I think that the demands of the 21st century are going to make us look more and more at business models that actually look at sharing in a business-like way uh, because we're going to have to share resources much more cleverly. I hate politics uh, in one sense that I think the way we have got ourselves into a bit of a mess in this country is that the fourth estate itself, the media, has, has if you like, through its rightful spirit of inquiry, gone beyond the normal spirit of inquiry to, if you like, cow politicians and turn them actually into politicians and not statesmen. And I find it really depressing that we find models described to us of politics which are responding to the public mood, responding, well if you responded to the public mood the world would still be flat and the blood would still lie in our veins still and the truth is that great statesmanship um, is about taking a vision of what the sunny uplands might look like translating it into a narrative that we, the people, can understand and then create frameworks to deliver it. At the moment, we just seem to get action plans, but without understanding why the action plan. It's, no, it's not a, a woven together tapestry of what the future may look like. So I think the, the, the budget, I mean, if one is trivial enough to say, what has the budget done for small business? I actually think the government un doesn't understand business at all. Uh, I think it's a bit like a form of pornography for it. They like the idea of Armani suits and black cars and being manly uh, and taking decisions uh, and haven't understood that most people who are very good business leaders are serious people who also understand risk and embrace the possibility of failure because that keeps them taut and on their toes. So yeah, it's a crap budget produced by people who don't understand business and don't understand that the opportunities that Britain are facing should actually have gone into creating a system of uh, encouraging investment in all those areas which we could become world leaders again. It's a fantastic opportunity and we could actually really cock it up. If you infantilize the colleagues that work with you by protecting them from knowledge about what's going on, they will tend to A, disrespect you, um, and B, because they're grown-ups, 
they will then suspect there's all sorts of bad things going on. So if they know that things aren't great, why don't you tell them exactly how not great it is so that they can share in judging you as to whether you're making the right calls. What you need to do, though, depending on what your own political persuasion is, Eden is a charitable trust that is run with commercial values because we know that we have to break even. But people are right at the heart of those values. And if you do put people at the heart of those values, you've got to manage the business in such a way that not only do you break even, but you look after those people. And many businesses don't do that. And I think businesses that don't look after people are not the sort of thing I'm interested in. I do understand corporate culture where, you know, you, know, you just live and die by the sword. Um, but if you do have a business like that, don't please talk to me about people being your greatest asset. They're not. You know, they're like bullets in a gun. That's it. And I believe that people are your greatest asset. You should invest and invest and invest and invest and invest. Clever things, people. Be counterintuitive. Too many people say they've got a project, then get angry that they don't get the money for it, and then blame the stupidity of public servants or bankers for their own failures. And the problem that they have built for themselves is that they haven't gone back to their own kitchen table and just breathed deeply and said, if someone was talking to me, trying to persuade me to get engaged with them, how would I put it? I think the best advice I can ever give anyone starting out is go in your imagination to the day after you have been successful and describe your excitement about your achievement and tell me what it tastes like and tell me what you're seeing with your eyes in terms of what you've done. Once you've got there, you can suddenly work out by going backwards the steps you need to put in play to get there. But unless you have a vision of what great looks like, you're never going to convince other people. Simply to say you've got a great idea isn't good enough. But if you say to somebody, I imagine, I imagine we've opened and we have the greatest conservatories in the world with the widest range of plants ever brought together in one place and it's hidden as an act of great theatre and the public love it because they know there's nothing like it on earth. Anybody can understand that vision. Now, it's easy to do that, say, about Eden, but I could do it about any project I was excited about. I could talk about the big lunch, the event we want to put on uh, this summer to try and get everybody in the country out onto the streets having lunch together and introducing themselves to their neighbours. The selling proposition is you, not me. The selling proposition is wouldn't it be great to live in a world where people did that and put two fingers up at the negative people to demonstrate that actually we're not all bad, we're not going to hell in a handcart. Um, and we can build resilient communities because we're homo sap, a clever little species. And it's true for any, any subject. If you can't get excited enough to have your eyes sparkle, don't bother to do it. Don't do it. I think business leaders are often, often remarkably ill-informed. Um, it's a bit like world-famous architects, um, uh, because they're working so hard. Uh, if you take the Michael Foot, Michael Foot once famously said, "The real tragedy of our times is that great books should be read by great leaders, but they simply haven't got the time." And many of our great business leaders don't have the time, because they're running great businesses, to be sucking new stuff in to be able to make them grow. That's why perhaps we have this cyclical nature of things that, you know, the one great idea, you suck it like a gobstopper until it's gone, rather than inventing new types of things to suck, so to speak, you know, making a bit of a mixed metaphor, but you know what I mean. I read a lot. I deliberately put myself in intellectual jeopardy by reading things that I'm not meant to read, by buying magazines, reading books that were not intended for me. You know, it's a bit like people who comment about social trends who've never watched EastEnders or Big Brother and they somehow think that's clever. No, I don't watch that stuff. Well, what an idiot. I mean, that actually reflects a popular mood. But get with it, learn what's going on, what's going on there. You may have a, an individual take on it and not agree with it, but at least speak about it, not like some old fart who hates popular music because it's so loud and clanging. You know, I mean, that's just not it. I think one should read widely, one should deliberately take one's views to the dry cleaners on a regular basis because you'd be surprised how many of the things you believe in when you actually start to really get on the surface you can't remember why you believe in it it's just like clothes you've put on and you realize that it's informed by not no knowledge just an emotional response to something 
I find that very stimulating. I think most people should do that, or else you end up just championing the same old, same old, um, for reasons that you can't. It's, it's not. It's not like Brighton through rock in you. It's just shallow.